Hello and welcome to DWeb Decoded, uh, our regular look around the world of the Falcon universe and further afield uh, for all things decentralized and web-based. We cover a pretty, a pretty broad base here. Um, my name is Danny O'Brien. Uh, I work for the Filecoin Foundation and the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. And one of the areas that I sort of concentrate on uh, is the human rights applications of the decentralized web. And also, flipping it a little bit, how sometimes we have to defend the decentralized web um, for its own sake and for the sake of the rights of everyone. And somebody who's been doing Doing that for a very long time now, I hope that isn't like damning, um, is, is Leah Holland, who is Campaign and Communications Director at the digital rights organization Fight for the Future. Leah's work focuses on issues like internet freedom, privacy, and the protection of civil liberties. And she's been instrumental in launching campaigns aiming to raise awareness about the dangers of mass surveillance technologies. Leah, like, that barely covers <laughs> what you <laughs> and Fight for the Future uh, do. But um, uh, maybe, I think Fight for the Future has such an interesting history. Maybe we can start with with how that started and how you got involved. Yeah, absolutely. So back, back in the day for Fight for the Future's Genesis event, which was the SOPA PIPA fight, uh, which was one of the largest online protests in history where Wikipedia blacked out, all these major websites put up banners to de defeat this, these undefeatable internet censorship bills that would have very fundamentally changed how the internet works here in the U.S., uh, Fight for the Future formed amongst the activists who had the brilliant ideas and led the online activism that dealt a resounding defeat to these bills. Um, and, and these sorts of proposals have been unable to gain traction in Congress since due to uh, the, the, the legacy of fear. Uh, I mean, <laughs> you, 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 <laughs> really behind us. you laugh, but I mean, we've both got a track record in doing this, which is that they keep coming back, right? Like that they keep trying and, um, uh, to pass these, these bills. And, um, it's, it's a, it's a, a constant effort to prevent laws like this from passing. Right. Which is why institutions like fight for the future came about. Yeah, I guess I'm getting a little bit in the weeds about like a site blocking bill versus uh, the, all the various other ways that they've they've tried to censor the internet and um, and and cement and centralization of the and the biggest players. Uh, but yeah, no, we are we are fighting bad internet bills constantly. Uh, we even have a bad internet bills website, and uh, and, and a lot of the work that that we do still focuses on those same principles against censorship and. For, for for privacy and anonymity online and and all of the all of the good stuff that that enables for 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 democracy and human rights I guess one of the challenges like you say is there's always something if you if your brief is like defend the internet <laughs> then you, there are attacks on every, at every angle in every country um, uh, uh, from commercial government um, uh, uh, Technical, authoritarian, democratic kind of attacks. How do, how has fight for the future decided where to take that fight? Like, how do you pick the topics that you're uh, you're, you're addressing? Oh my gosh, it is incredibly difficult to choose. There are far more issues now than we, as an organization of I think we're fourteen people, including contractors, could could ever could ever truly take on. So a lot of times we will choose uh, or throw throw in when a bill is close to passing uh, and it would have really large negative human rights impacts, especially for traditionally marginalized communities of the global majority. And um, and then also there's a, there's also a component of personal passion among the team to an extent. Like we as activists get to choose the stuff that we think is is most important and bring that to the team and and advocate to work on it, which is a very cool and I think a bit unique format uh, for an organization like ours. But it's it's definitely in our special special sauce, as it were, that a lot of what we work on is things that we're personally passionate about and uh, and, and and couldn't couldn't not move forward. Or, or fight against or fight for. 
Yeah, I mean, I think personally contextualizing fight for the future amongst like a huge group set of people and institutions who who, who work on the the barricades, as it were. Like, I've always thought of your organization as incredibly like agile. It's small, right? And you 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 punch way way uh, uh, bigger than your size. Um, I mean, I describe we 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 were in a thing with public knowledge, which is one of the more kind of official sort of organizations in DC. And I did describe you as like the gorilla wing of, <laughs> of public knowledge, which public knowledge was really flattered by. They were like, oh yeah, that makes us sound so much cooler to be associated with Fight for the Future. But like you've done these amazingly sort of visible campaigns on a on a shoestring over the years have you got like any particular favorites that people might have um might have seen oh my gosh so so many favorites and and yeah we are very much like ideologically small and agile we have on-team devs and an on-team designer and what have you that allows us to we have to remind ourselves constantly that when partners say, hey, we want to do this quickly, um, that our time scale is different <laughs> than, than a lot of the organizations around us just because we've, we've, we've maintained that orientation so strongly and it's been one of our superpowers. Uh, I'm thinking back to um, one of our big successful call campaigns over the past several years. And you said initially that the uh, that I've been doing this work for a long time. And I'd say, in like the time scale of Web3, yes, I've been doing this work for a very long time. <laughs> I, well, I never know because I, I want it to be flattering. But then yeah. I'm like, oh, does that just imply that like you're a dried up bean, right? But, oh, um, but I mean, like, you know, you're established, right, Leah? You've, 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 you've you've paid your dues i've been i've been doing it i don't know i feel like there's always going to be more dues to pay but um but let's see original question we were thinking that i was thinking back to uh there was this back in 2020 when there was that big infrastructure package that had all these awful tacked on provisions for uh regulating cryptocurrency um we saw the like the, the, the large scale impacts of, of those sorts of provisions. And we used all of our tools and, and technology to um, to drive, uh, like I think it was like 40,000 calls to Congress in the matter of a couple of days. And we delayed an infrastructure package that uh, that was pretty, pretty urgent and a top priority for the entire U.S. government. Uh, while 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 they went back and forth on, on those provisions and while ultimately um, you know, they, they, they passed, we brought a new level of scrutiny and, and, and the, the put cryptocurrency and web three and the concerns around the right to code and what have you in the, um, in, in, in the mindscapes of, uh, of some of our elected leaders for the, the first time in a, in a big way that they couldn't ignore. I think for me, one of the things that that did was a really important shift, which, I mean, it was fairly early on in the battles that crypto has had um, against sort of overregulation or misregulation. But um, even though I think the SBF scandals and things like that were post that. Yeah. But, but SBF was riding high at that time. Yeah, right. But like there was definitely a sense, uh, particularly amongst Democrats, right, that they were being money lobbied by something that to them just looked like in inseparable from like big banks or big finance or um or you know big tech um and it was very hard for people to say no there's like actually a bunch of not only smaller companies and st startups and things like that, which is, you know, sort of important, but also like individuals that care about this, either because they're impacted or because of their own principles. And I do, I do remember the dialogue shifting, uh, particularly on the democratic side. Well, actually both sides when they sort of realized, Oh, the, this, this comes with a constituency, right? This comes with voters. And uh, a lot of the conversations really changed after that. Um, and a lot of the polling too, like suddenly people started realizing that there might be people who are even single issue voters about, about this kind of thing. Do you think that that's like, what is you, how do you see yourself in the role between sort of connecting lawmakers and 
this sort of larger public that you're sort of trying to to either activate or represent? Yeah, yeah. I think that there were several things going on there that were really fascinating. The first of which was that um, a lot of people approached that situation with a, well, we have money, let's throw money at it type of um, type of ethos, which is effective for some lawmakers and not so effective for others. And, uh, and that the people who were the loudest um, were mostly the, the money throwers with the crypt- crypto utopianism and what, and what have you. And, uh, and that what wasn't represented was some of these constituencies that you were talking about. So like small, small developers, projects that are focused on, on privacy, on building alternatives to big tech and on, on actually doing, um, doing the work of laying the foundation for these alternative technologies to, to bring meaningful change to our digital lives that is desperately needed. And what we tried to do uh, when, when we met with lawmakers, because we're not traditionally like a, a straight up lobbying behind the scenes organization we're much more an internet outrage type organization but <laughs> but we really saw the need there nobody was talking about projects like like um no, no nobody from the human rights space was coming in and saying hey these things might be important these things might be a part of the future that we want to see please don't kill the future that we want to see before it can even show us what's possible yeah. And and that was really the role that we played there. We sort of we made the argument for um, for more thoughtful regulation. Not this is a this is a nail. This is a hammer. Let's just slam 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 it in. You know. Yeah. With, with the with a blunt a blunt instrument and blunt reg- regulation that didn't take into account the true impacts. I think that there's an interesting like this is a challenge across kind of tech tech regulation is and you see this in copyright as well, where if it's cached in a certain way where you have big industry players kind of saying, hey, this is wrong or we need to sort this out, there's a real feeling that like some compromise could be struck, right? The regulators say, okay, well, let's get everybody in the room and sort something out. And that's fine if like there wasn't like civil liberties uh, implications to this because or if, like everybody's actually in the room because that's what we find over and over again everybody is never in the room whether they're right. talking about crypto or about ai or about anything else everybody is never in the room right right and you know there was always this air of well this is like this is like any other financial project crypto cryptocurrency is just like we'll get the big players and also we'll treat it like that right so a lot of the financial system is heavily surveilled at this point and um and that's because it's well, a lot of reasons i guess but it's kind of constrained in its own sort of toxic brew, right? But this, these, these things that you were fighting against would have splurged that surveillance across every aspect of people's lives. Um, is that the, the? I mean, that was the bit that got my heart thumping and clicking on your 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 messaging, right? Is that like, no, you can't say, okay, every. Uh, uh, non-custodial wallet uh, should have to go through these these things because that's not just another bank, right? That's my that's my that's my computer. Those are my private keys that you're messing with. Uh, h- how do you convey that to to lawmakers? Well, the thing that we reached for right away, and one of the strongest tools in our arsenal there is storytelling. Like we needed to give specific examples of how this would impact people that um, that lawmakers care about, or um, or, or or just the unintended consequences um, that we'd see down the road from that sort of bill. So, like the 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 non custodial wallets or the, the 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 those regulations at the time. We, we brought examples of like, well, what if you're an artist who's, um, who's, who's selling an NFT and now you're just like doing an individual person to person transaction, you're now responsible for, uh, all of this filing and you could go to prison if you, if you, if you don't do all of this, this, uh, wild amount of bookkeeping, um, and reporting, or if you're a decentralized community internet project, um, that cumulatively with your customers moves that sort of, 
uh, uh, that, that sort of level of funds to meet the threshold could the organizer of the community internet project which is something that's desperately needed especially in rural communities throughout the US um, go to prison because they found an alternative where none was offered by any other of these big corporations that um, that this legislation was sort of trying to cement into being the only options even for communities where internet from big tech wasn't an option yeah i think there's often this this scenario where they sort of regulation comes along and they're aiming at big tech or what they think of as big tech and they're just sideswiping like all the alternatives to the decentralized alternatives at the same time um yeah so yeah <laughs> <laughs> and, and and it's funny too because like in those in those meetings at the time and still today I think this just came up again last week uh, if we talk to Republicans they carry on about you know financial privacy and looking at like which January Sixers bought whatever at Dick's Sporting Goods through their bank statements or what have you and if we talk to leftists about deplatforming of abortion funds from PayPal or. Uh, um, or the Stop Cop City RICO indictments, which were wild. Uh, they, they also value privacy, and there's actually this incredible swath of bipartisan common ground. It just seems like people still aren't talking to each other about, about why each community, no matter what their interest or orientation, think that privacy is super important. So I see a stronger case than ever to be made and more and more people to make it um, for for alternatives to uh, to financial surveillance. Yeah, I mean, uh, we definitely hear interest in communities sort of, I mean, I wouldn't even characterize it as across the political spectrum, right? Because they're just people who are marginalized in some way from either because they're traditional marginalized communities or they are just by, they're going to be the new marginalized communities, right? Because they're trying to do something that doesn't fit in with what um, the standard sort of cookie cutter centralized systems want. Um, and everybody has these isolated, like often like awful stories where they're just going, yeah, I, you know, my PayPal account was canceled. I lost all this money. Um uh, you know, there's nothing I can do, or I'm being put on a list because of this. Um, and trying to, like, all of these point to the same thing, the thing that the, 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 the Fight for the Future points out, like, so clearly, which is sort of abstract in a way, right? It's, you know, you just say, yeah, this is all about excessive surveillance causing false, false positives. Um, uh, but getting those people together and finding the stories that cross cross all of those lines is is tricky. Like, how do you do? People come to you, or do you go searching for the right the right voice in these settings? A bit of both. Uh, with our campaign against the Kids Online Safety Act, we did a letter of um, from trans parents, or parents of trans kids, rather. And they were, uh, and, and that letter and the, the invitation to sign on to it went virally throughout uh, the community of people because all those people are connected. And from it, we found some incredibly strong advocates to speak to legislators, their own representatives in their own communities about their concerns with the bill. And that's been extremely powerful. So some people come to us, some people find us through the organizing work that that we do, and sometimes we see a news story or, or, or reach out proactively otherwise, but uh, it's it's really just keeping an eye out constantly on, on what's going on in, in the media landscape and creating those those focus points to bring people together so that we can, uh, we can find those advocates. So often these are cases either where you're sort of forming an alliance with people who are affected by this or sort of trying to inject some issues around human rights or things that just affect individuals in conversations that seem to be about like, you know, the financial sector or um, uh, arguments between two branches of, of the tech oligopoly. Um, but one of the things I love about Five for the Future is sometimes it's just you, right? Sometimes you're like the only people standing up for a, a, a principle or 
very few other people. I, and the one that 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 I I I really admired what you were doing um, and supported. I was like the other person um, is uh, is Tornado Cash, right? So Tornado Cash, absolutely. Like you know, when the indictments came out, like you know, there were two ways of looking at it. One was this was you know a horrible geo. Um, political sort of North Korea, like smuggling money, um, you know, uh, tendrils into huge amounts of terrorism, um, uh, trafficking, drugs, and all of these things, right? And and that was the thing that dominated the headlines. And then the second, the flip underside story was that this was an attempt. For those of you who don't know the Tornado Cash story, I can't explain it all, but like you can Google it. Um, uh, an attempt to control code and control developers and basically make developers liable uh, for what people were doing with their code. Um, and it was amazing because that first version of the story dominated things absolutely so much that so many of the people that you would expect to defend that other principle just either went quiet or um, uh, you know fell over right and and just went well this is a this is a special exception and you you, you fight for the futures stood up for for that principle. Um, was that a hard decision to make internally? Not in terms of the principles of it and the facts being on our side. It was very clear that the downstream chilling effect of anybody thinking about contributing to open source code that might ever be used in a privacy preserving project was 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 incredibly har harmful to the future of the internet and to the future of the human right to privacy online. So there we were good. It is true though that that swimming against the grain like that is is takes a lot of energy, and uh, and and a lot of effort. And it's one of the hardest things that that we do is is directly head on challenging those incredibly dominant. Uh, narratives when when they are so powerful, and that that is a specialty that <laughs> that we have. <laughs> but we do like when these moments come up, we look at each other like you know, we know we get on a call or what have you to decide what to do. And we're just like, oh man, here we go again. <laughs> All right, but who I needs us to order lunch? We gotta get out the chocolate. Let's go. <laughs> but I think it's such a benefit of having a, a small organization inspired by like you said the individual values of your um uh, 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 of your team right in the again like i have been one of those people in a past life kind of making those compromises ultimately where you go and i mean before we throw everybody else under the bus like i did know that everybody a lot of other people were going well we can't like do a big campaign, but we're going to work behind the scenes. And so there was a lot of sort of not just silent lobbying, but for instance, you know, making sure that GitHub didn't just, you know, delete code at the, at the whim of, of a prosecution um, was an important stand to make. And people did a lot of lobbying. And as far as I remember, GitHub did, did respond to that. Um, but but it, 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 I think that gives you a reputation for being more principled, which brings people back into the fold, right? Like when you say, oh, actually, we're going to stand in solidarity for people using crypto, people know that you're doing that out of principle rather than you know, the SBF has just <laughs> like given you millions of dollars. Um, I mean, they can tell that from your staffing chart right but 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 uh, i think that people respect like those those values and um and and go through it do you do you just go away on a retreat at some point and like kind of every year and go well what are our values now do we like this do we like this what do we think about ai or is it every campaign is kind of a new thing where you're sort of 
if we're going to launch uh, so so much of our work feeds into what comes next with technology so our facial right. we've been campaigning on facial recognition for years and years and years and so our very firm foundation on facial recognition and the artificial intelligence quote unquote uh, of, of that technology um, has fed into some of the stances that we're taking on AI now, but we are mixing those with our um, w- with our, our principles on access to knowledge and, and, and preserving culture and anti-censorship work and, and what have you because we because we as, as an organization fundamentally look at how the internet works. Um, when we're making our decisions on on whether we're endorsing a bill or what we're going to say about a specific piece of legislation, and we know right away to look downstream and to look at the at, at how um, traditionally marginalized communities are going to be impacted. That's that's the, the the foundation of our analysis. And we, I mean, if we were to try to go out on retreat to establish our stances on every new net technology that's coming out right now. It would be like two months you, long. So I know so you'd have a great vacation and you'd come yeah. back and all everything would have been passed. Come back terrified. <laughs> come back terrified. I mean, you know, like I'm I'm learning a lot right now about neural data privacy and uh, and and that sort of that sort of work and how we might fit into it and what's needed in that space. And I, and I think that each person individually is is uh, on our team is also constantly monitoring we have a team member who's working on mask bans right now because there are places across the country that are now banning people from wearing masks which is horrific for um disabled and immunocompromised folks as well as for activists and right um, right it's very a very physical embodiment of like your your right to sort of your your yourself but also like is sort of the physical equivalent of anonymity online in in some ways, right? Yeah, well, I mean, with facial recognition and cameras everywhere, right. like they're just going to be watching a constant stream of everywhere we go, and like you know, digital phrenologizing how we feel about the latest tampon or whatever, you know, like. <laughs> so I wanted to jump back. You said neural data, like yeah. privacy, like neural as in AI neural nets, or neural as in human brain nets. As in, um, as in, like thought reading and thought influencing technology, right. you know, right. uh, your your fun Elon Musk new projects and what have you. Like Colorado passed a neural data privacy bill recently, but it turns out that it's kind of toothless and it's very interesting. There's a lot of Central and South American countries that are actually way more progressive about the right to think your own thoughts and the right to yeah. not have them influence and the right to have them be private. And um, and that's one of the technologies that in our fight with facial recognition or with these with 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 things that have become more established and we arrive maybe a little bit late to the scene. This is one that's only going to get more um that's only going to have greater impact and become more entrenched as time goes on. And I'd love to see us getting in there early, but uh, I haven't even talked to the whole team about this yet. So yeah. here's a preview I, oh, okay. of the future. Hi, <laughs> team. For your so, well, <laughs> I am. Um, uh, yeah, I completely agree in uh, the first issue of the magazine that comes with D web decoded D web digest that we run. Uh, Mike Masnick edited one and the piece that um, uh, I, I, I put my hand up for was sort of riffing on this cognitive liberty idea, right? And like, it, it can work both ways. Like we're having this attack on essentially being able to extrapolate from external data, right? Into what we're thinking. And as you say, like, sounds ridiculous now but like i talk to people in this space and they're like going oh no the stuff that we use to to read brains can also be used to influence them so we're worried about that um but also like as a line to draw right that 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 um you know uh, uh it's often quite hard to explain why you should lock in privacy in a mobile phone, right? As, as, uh, um, uh, uh, and over time, people are beginning to get the idea that, like, actually, your mobile phone is as private as your own thoughts, right? There's a lot of connection between that, and so this idea of not only defending what's what's in your mind, but saying actually, the perimeter of my mind, this basic privacy, 
extends just a little bit further out of that, right? It extends into my personal devices, some of the data that I'm using, and that sh that we should have stronger protections about that than even that we have even that like the somewhat weak privacy protections we have in other spaces. No, I. I, I, I want to, I, I will sign up. I, I want to know more. <laughs> so, yeah, we all, we all want that. We all want the human right to privacy as a U.S. law in a way that is that stifles all of the crap technologies that are going to come in, in the future and even now and just make these wild marketing pitches that are often completely just bullshit. Uh, right. and, uh, and, and, and sell and, and like harm people while selling a bad product, while entrenching surveillance, while, 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 like we, the, the ultimate goal is federal data privacy legislation. Um, and it's just been so depressing to watch Congress be, uh, unable to do anything, um, yeah. when it comes to our rights there for a really long time. But. And it's all—it's always about like establishing and keeping to a line, right? Like so, right now, um, Google Chrome, after years of battling by activists like yourself, um, finally upgraded to a thing that basically prevents ad blockers from from working. Manifest V3, I think. Um, and now you and I are talking here and going, well, if we lose that capability of blocking ads. Um, in the browser, like, how are you going to defend it when those ads are being beeped into your brain, right? Or in your VR helmet, right? Or, or whatever. Like, you have to keep those lines and fight them, even if it seems counterintuitive. Yeah, the surveillance monster feeds on itself 100%. And, and at Fight for the Future, like, a lot of what we do isn't just about keeping the lines. It's about deciding when we need to move the Overton window. And that's... that's Move like, out, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Getting, getting back to a lot of the work that we do. Um, we need to push the conversations into spaces that are maybe less comfortable, more controversial, to um, folks who haven't really done the deep thinking and, and, and make it make it okay to start to say things like we should ban that technology or um, or not not feel afraid of these intimidating big tech actors who'd love it if we'd all shut up. So I will jump into the, like the world of actual decentralized web because we just got kind of oh, yeah, sidetracked into your work. But, but, <laughs> but I have one more thing, right, which is um, another thing that I really love – I love about F Five for the Future, but I wish there were more. Right? Um, is it's not just explaining these risks to lawmakers, but I think you play a really important role in explaining the complexities of these stories or the, this technology to the people who are most affected by it. Right? Um, in the the you know there are there are risks and there are opportunities with crypto or decentralized tech in general, right? Or alternatives to big tech. And um, having a place where people can feel comfortable discussing that at kind of a high level where, you know, they're not suddenly going to be exploited by, by a Google or whatever who has come into a community and gone, hey, we have these amazing toys, like, would you want it? And like, so, and if they say yes, suddenly they're kind of giving the stamp of approval to, um, to a tech in their, in their neighborhood. Do you, have you, I feel like you do play this role, right? Of like being the people that people can turn to, to ask about whether this technology is good or not. Is that something that you now kind of like consciously think of as part of your role? Um, or is that always, again, sort of a side effect of doing the advocacy work? Oh, that's a little chicken or eggy for, for me. We, we get people emailing in or comments or what have you asking these questions, and, uh, and, and we do our best to respond, but we're also a very, very small team. So yeah. the reality of <laughs> whether or not uh, whether or not we can always answer or whether or not we've done analysis on some of the technologies that are being asked about or whether those questions are being asked in good faith because that's a huge question that's a huge whole other thing too yeah. because the internet is going to internet no matter how principled your stances um, right. so so I think that we do base it in uh, advocacy and our technolo technological analysis there and then we do our best to point people as they have questions towards the right 
uh, towards the, towards the right resource. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, and that might be a bit more of a side effect, but being able to break it down and explain it to people so that they can take action and, and actually care about these technologies that are often made unnecessarily complicated by um, by lobbyists and lo- and corporate lawyers and what have you um, is a really important part of what we do. We try to try to explain it in a way that everybody can understand. Because it's, and in the end, it's usually not really that hard. It's just that no. want, people want people want the masses to think that these technologies are too complicated for them to understand so that they can do things without public scrutiny. Yeah. And we're a big force against that. Yeah. I, um, so uh, I'm just looking at the letter you wrote, which I think sort of summarizes a lot of what we're talking about here from, uh, beginning of 2022, and uh, you pulled together a coalition of 27 human rights organizations um, to basically just a very broad thing saying, look, when you regulate decentralized tech, if you regulate decentralized tech, realize that it is a transformational tool for a lot of the people that are most affected by the bad things that you're trying to control, right? And uh, the quote from you is, we are concerned that lawmakers ire for big tech and Silicon Valley might accidentally result in their killing off alternatives that benefit marginalized people. Um, So, but uh, uh, having given that sort of wrap up to what you do, the other thing that is sort of interesting is when you yourself use that decentralized tech, right? So um, uh, the the excuse, the hook that we're running off on this is that you have a new campaign and you have uh, a, a short story collection, but maybe you can explain what's the campaign and... Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, this is a very fun project for me as as an author. It is the first ever call for short stories that I have brought together. Uh, and so we at Fight for the Future are working with the folks at RightsCom, which is one of the biggest uh, international human human rights conferences out there, um, as well as Strange Horizons, which is a very celebrated oh, yeah. fiction um, magazine, and uh, and Compost Magazine, which is a decentralized um, magazine that focuses on a lot of a lot of D web, uh, the juicy good D web stuff, and uh, and we're we're looking for short stories right now. We have this website stoppropaganda.org that challenge dominant narratives on centralized surveillance technology and uh, and propaganda um, that is written about it. So much of fiction these days, um, screenwriters, authors, just storytellers in general sort of like accept these premises from these companies that the facial recognition is going to work and the code's doing what it says it's going to do. And yeah, this is how you catch bad guys and this is how you make a safer world and... and, and um, and a lot of these people, when I asked them about, well, why did you, why did you write that? Why did, why, why did you, you build your story that way? It's um, to perpetuate that perception. They sort of stutter on it. It's because it's maybe something that they haven't thought about. Absolutely right. And so we don't just want to critique that necessarily. We're working to. A, buy some short stories that do a better job, and then B, create a toolkit analyzing those short stories and giving authors and storytellers, screenwriters, everybody, a new uh, a, a new set of thoughts to think with, I guess, uh, on how, um, how they might tell stories that have more of a tech justice focus, that aren't such propaganda, that... That promote alternatives and um, and and a different sort of looking looking we're looking for different sort of heroes here using different sorts of technologies um, and and achieving better better things than like we got the bad guy on camera and the and the court cases in the bag or what have you. Yeah, I mean, I often like we get calls from journalists. And I used to be a journalist, so, but I'm so talking to them, and of course, a lot of stories about crypto are kind of like. Oh, like bad, X bad thing is happening, and then somebody has some um, snake oil that will fix that problem, right? And they don't really want 
they're not really interested in someone who goes, actually, none of this is true. And like, you need this article is not going to this article, you've, you've been sold a bill of goods because no journalist wants to hear that, right? Like you wasted your last three days. But like one of the things that, that you can point out is like, actually, there's a better story here, right? Like it's, it's a little bit more complicated, but it has much more of the ring of the truth than the press release that you're writing from right now. Like there's a, there's a twist in the tale here where, like the people that you thought were the good guys uh, are actually like morally ambiguous. And it doesn't take, it really doesn't take much, but like you say, there aren't those resources. Uh, there aren't those resources like, and journalism has been gutted too. So like the right. ability in the space as a journalist, if you're, if you're still able to work as a journalist these days, <laughs> like the number of journalists who have the space to think critically about a press release, the, release that they receive or to to do that analysis or to speak to experts it's just it's just so small so we see a lot more parroting and a lot less um a lot less critical coverage of um of of these technologies as they roll out or and and a lot of times folks will just accept the narrative that comes from the corporation or that comes from the the police association or what have you and um and yeah i think that just the It'd be it'd be nice and fresh to see to see that being done differently. So we're making some resources to try to try to help people do that. So uh, the campaign site is stopcopaganda.org, uh, and we'll spell that out somewhere down there. Um, and uh, the, are you collect? Is it a call for short stories, or do you have your short stories? Yeah, it is a call so. for short stories. It's open now um, through November twenty first. We've already gotten some really awesome ones. It's been very. This is so cool. I'm just so jazzed. Uh, and yeah, um, we're we're gonna buy five. Um, they're gonna get published in Strange Horizons in a special edition, and then be a part of our toolkit. And then one of the authors, we're gonna actually fly out to Taipei, Taiwan, for Rights Con. 2025 to work with us on creating the toolkit. So uh, all around, it's it's just it's just going to be incredible. And in a couple of months, I'm going to be telling you about um, this this digital toolkit with Compost Magazine that we've published through IPFS and Filecoin that's uncensorable around the world for crea- anybody. Right. So, so super jazz. There's, there's, there's the money moment, right? Like like the the other thing is is the compost is something that we've supported and the compost team who we've actually had on 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 D-Web uh, Decoded a long time ago when they were just starting on this, built this really good platform that everybody should uh, should check out called Distributed Press, uh, which lets you build a little mini website and then push it out on IPFS, Filecoin, all of the decentralized or many of the decentralized protocols that people use, but um, alternative ways of getting uh, uncensored, uncensored information. Yeah, and if um, people aren't authors and they're like, this sounds awesome, I want this to exist, think about where you could promote it um, so that it gets in front of more authors that were doing this call. That would be my big ask of, of the audience. If you can amplify the website, please do. Yeah, I think that, the, you know, if you're, if you're watching this, I hope you're vaguely interested in distributed decentralized technology and you haven't like declined an in interest as you've watched the rest of this. But like, I think the key thing is, is you're the people who know as he looks into the camera, you're the people who know what is right and wrong in these areas, right? You're the sort of people who can explain to the average person that you probably have to do all the time, like what are the risks, what are the dangers, and just communicating this out. Hopefully this will give you a good toolkit of metaphors, analogies, and interesting stories, true and um, and, and science fictionalized for you to help and you can also help by donating to Fight for the Future. You <laughs> Dang right you can. Uh, fightforthefuture.org. Uh, we take crypto. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Leah. Um, uh, best of luck with the project. And I hope to have you on the show again soon and, uh, and find out what, uh, what stories have been unfilled. Incredible, Danny. It's always so fun to talk to you. I can't wait to be back just so we can chat yeah. again. Thank you so much. Thank you.